Thank you for joining us at Mount Pleasant Baptist. Once again, let me have a word of prayer with you. Father, as we go into this time of study, we thank you for the, the words that come from Paul's pen, from the inspiration that he has received from your Holy Spirit. And I pray, God, that we would be open to that same inspiration as we think about what you want us to know as your church, your body here in this world. And I pray that you would speak openly, help our ears to be attentive, our minds to absorb, and our hearts to be excited about it. And give us a will, God, to continue to do the work with strength and power and service that you've called us to do. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Dear church, you might want to watch your step. Let me introduce something to you uh, in this message through a writer by the name of Alex. Her name is Alex Seeley. She is the pastor of the Belonging Company Church. She writes in her book called The Opposite Life, these words. As the church, God calls us to live unlike the world. She explains that we for we're foreigners here on earth we were commissioned to go beyond our lifestyle, our culture, our ignorance, and into the world to make disciples and to teach everyone to obey what Jesus has taught us. She says, we are to teach them God's way of doing things according to the kingdom of heaven. This way of life offers us the greatest joy and personal reward and allows us to live free and content, to be exactly what God created us to be, to live abundantly in harmony and unity with power and more blessing than we can contain. Her challenge is in this part of her publication by this sentence. Maybe we can become the solution to the world's decaying problems. This is a timely message for us. So, church, we need to watch our step. We need to be careful in the things we do and say and our, our motivation, but also our goals that we set. How do we look to the rest of the world? That begins our uh, next step series, or this being our fifth message in the series that we're on called Dear Church. And we're in the last uh, three or four verses of Scripture in the book of Philippians, actually beginning with verse 27, the apostle says, above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Jesus Christ. I think the first point that Paul would make to us here is to let your life reflect the good news that you have already surrendered to. He said to First Timothy, or to Timothy in his first letter to him in chapter four, this means take action. He says, set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Now that's a multifaceted action piece, but it is. It's about taking action and modeling for the rest of the world to see exactly what Jesus was. And as believers in this world, as the church, we must rise to that occasion. We're not to be uh, residents of this world. We're to be foreigners. We're to be set apart. We're to look different. We're to have a different leader in our own hearts. We're to be ruled by God and not by the rest of society or the way the world um, would have us spin in its favor. He says in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Be humble. So to Timothy, he points out, we should take action in every way, in the way we speak, in the way we conduct our lives, in the way that we demonstrate love. By the way, that is the way the world will understand that we're different, is that we will love and they'll know that we belong to Jesus. But also in faith and trusting Jesus, and in purity, keeping ourselves non-diluted, undiluted by the rest of what the world offers. Be pure, be trusting, and, in, and let those things show up in our, the way we conduct our lives, the way we talk to each other, the way we talk to the world. 
and the way we love. So, but to the Roman church, he says, don't think of yourself as being haughty now just because you've got these, these things that you're working for. And if we call ourselves purity, then that would not be a humble way of seeing it, or excuse me, calling ourselves pure. That would not be a humble approach to the whole thing. But he says, don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but with sober judgment in accordance to the faith God has distributed in each of you See yourselves under that light. We were needy. God met our need. We were on a different path. And God showed us the right way. And we chose to follow him. Now in Luke, we hear Jesus say this as we think about reflecting on the good news that we have already surrendered to. The good news included that we should love our enemies. Jesus said that love your enemies, do good to them and lean and lead uh, lend to them without expecting to get anything back, then your reward will be great and you will be the children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Because that's the standard God set for us through Christ Jesus. He goes on in the next passage. Excuse me, that was verse 26. In verse 27, he says, I will, and, and whether I'm present or absent, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. The apostle wanted to know where they stood and he'll know where they stand, that they stand in one spirit, firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. We need this right now, folks. The world is disrupting. It is also, it's also on fire around us. It's, and the corruption is spreading like wildfire. Each one wants to show without dignity our place in this world by, by saying things and doing things and reporting things and standing against things. And, and rarely do we see what the world really is standing for. And so many of us want to stand for other things or so many different things that it's hard to point out what our main goal is. And it's important to stand on truth and right living. It's important to stand on the things that God stands on and stands for. God stands for justice. God stands for truth. God stands for love, mercy, forgiveness, kindness. This, these kinds of things tell us exactly what a community of faith in Christ looks like. So this is the message I think in this, in this passage. It is simply to, as a community of faith, stand together. Now, there are several things we hear in this, in this one phrase, and that is that we need to be one. We need to stand as one together under the umbrella of the thing that made us all the same. Because we're all unique. We're all different. But the one thing that makes us brothers and sisters identify with the same Father is that we have the same Spirit by the salvation that came through Christ Jesus that moment we were saved, we had a renewed sense of self through the spirit that was brought into our lives. That reminds us from time to time, we're either on the right track or we're doing good. Stay there. So to, to um, as a community of faith, to stand together means that we have this sense of oneness and to, to be as one. One of the things I've been watching on uh, Right Now Media is the lessons that Andy Stanley brings about how politics and religion can join together, can be brought together. By the way, you can find that on YouTube. And it's, um, it's on uh, Talking Points is the main category you can find that under. Just search under YouTube and look for Andy Stanley Talking Points. And look for then the subtitle, How Politics and Religion Blend. Now, the perfect blend is not going to be there. And we're in a stage of living right now where, well, in this particular stage of this year, which has been a difficult year to begin with, and now we're faced with a very, very tumultuous um, decision time by election, voting, casting our vote. And it's dangerous for us. There are so many people getting ridiculed and, and being um, physically threatened, if not already beaten for some of the stands we want to take and the people that we describe as being the appropriate leader for our country. 
but rather it being a message about politics. And this is the message from the apostle to us at this time in our life, in this time of the year, for this particular election, the church must remain strong. Don't have division among you. You can differ in opinion, but that doesn't mean you differ in your mission as believers in Jesus Christ, that we stay together in thought and word and, and presenting ourselves that way. Now we can vote based on how the Lord leads us to vote, based on those principles and the platform that we would, should, should desire to follow. But I think the most important thing is, regardless what happens at the election, is what the church continues to do. Don't be divisive over political differences. Stay together, work together for the main cause of making the world a different place. We can't depend on politics and legislature to do what the church must do. And that is being a part of pleading to the heart and soul of an individual so that change takes place on the inside with a desire to be what God wants us to be. So as a community of faith, we need to stand together as one, together under the umbrella of our own salvation that brought us the Holy Spirit, that brought us a united mission. But we also need to take the word stand firm as an indicator that we are standing firm in one spirit, meaning that we can be, we're going to be immovable. We are not going to move. We're not going to be swayed one way or the other. We're not going to be taken in a different route than what is necessary. We are going to stand firm, immovable for the thing that God has called us to do, a mission and the challenge of speaking truth when the world doesn't really want to hear what the spiritual truth really is. Also, the word striving together really kind of, kind of speak to me in this passage. Striving together is one for the faith of the gospel. That says to me, when we include the faith of the gospel, that we're talking about an activity that we're doing together. We're striving forward, meaning it's not going to be easy. It's going to be tough. Sometimes we have to move some major obstacles, but we're going to strive together as one in an active ministry. And that's calling all of us to activity. It, this is not the time to be a, an innocent bystander or a spectator. It's time to get on the field. It's time to get on the court. It's time to be involved. Get your training, scriptural truth, your own understanding of what the Lord is telling you individually about your own personal spiritual gift. As a church, it's time to be active together, including everyone. Now, soon you're going to be hearing about a ministry fair that we're going to have that would include everybody's options, not just members of this church, but what you can do as someone in the community that wants to join a community of faith and be part of a movement that is going to make the world look a little different, regardless of the politics, regardless of the current state that our church, that our country is in or our community is in. But we can make a difference united and God within us will help that stand to be profitable. So we're, we've heard two things thus far out of this passage. Let your life reflect the good news that you have already surrendered to through the action you take, the humility that you should have, and the way that you love your enemies. I missed that passage early on, but Luke chapter 6, verse 35 says, love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them. I think I did mention that. Lend to them without expecting to get any, anything back. Now, our reward in heaven would be great, but you will be children of the Most High now because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. We're going to act like God. And then the second point was, as a community of faith, stand together. Don't be divisive. Don't be divided. Don't let the, uh, the negativity and the disruptions and the, and the wayward thoughts, even within the church, stray, make you go astray from what the mission God has called us to do together. But the third point is this, there's something that does divide us, something that helps us or makes us look in other ways, in other areas for, for things that would make us feel secure rather than God. So Paul says this, without being frightened, another way of saying that without being startled or scared or intimidated by the world, 
in any way, <clears throat> excuse me, in any way by those who oppose, oppose you. Don't let anyone who oppose you frighten you. This is a sign to them. This is proof of, or this is what this, this reality is pointing to, that they will be destroyed, but you will be saved, and that by God. Now, let's unpack that just a little bit. Don't let fear pull you apart. When the apostle, or when the, excuse me, when the people treat you badly because of your faith, this only proves that they don't know God and that they're on a path of destruction. It also shows us that there are still people that need to hear the gospel, even our enemies. It also proves that your salvation is real, that it comes from God. Now, we've heard this before, that uh, in times when you feel like you've been challenged because of your faith, then you must be, you must be relevant. You must be doing something right. You must be saying the right things because it's causing people to be stirred up about it. When the apostles first got started, they were criticized as being those who were turning the world upside down. Oh, forbid, right? No, bring it on. It's time to make a difference in the world, to change the way the world is. Only God can do that. Politics and governments, wars, and people who stand against one another on different sides of the road with banners and shouting uh, insults to each other, that's not changing anything. It's important to let people know where you stand on social issues. And we have the right in this country to uh, protest but do it safely and without malicious intent, which would take the stand as a loving group in terms of where the church should be in that. But we're to do more. We're to promote and encourage and make room for people so that they can have an effective voice in this world based on the word of God. So, Paul goes on in verse 29 and says, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle, that is the conflict you're having or the fights that you've been in, that you saw I had, says the apostle, and now hear that I still have. Let's draw this down to where we are. We are living the ultimate life right now. Paul says, it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ to believe in him. We're living the ultimate life. To trust in Jesus means we're not alone in our struggle. We believe in him and he has granted his favor in us. Listen to Psalm 23, 4. David wrote these within the, the great shepherd's psalm. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me, your rod and your staff. Protect and comfort me. We're not alone. God has promised to come with us. In fact, because you are a believer, and if you aren't, we have more to ask of you then to think about. But if you are a believer, you have been given the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now, those are not just words lifted from a page. That is me saying what my experience has been. I have felt the Holy Spirit change my attitude, change my direction. He has frozen me in my tracks to let me think about what I'm getting ready to do. And he has given me this sense that I am either on the right path or I'm not. He has stopped me from saying things that I know I shouldn't have said to begin with, even though in my heart I wanted to lash out. He has given me a different path, a different attitude in which I could say those things. And he's given me timing to do it. If we listen to God, we're not alone. And he's guiding us through these difficult times, this dark rose, this dark path, this darkest time of life that we may have ever experienced. And I don't think it's going to get any better. So trusting in Jesus means that we're not alone in this struggle. 
but it also means that we have a life abundant. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. And we're going through the same struggle as all other believers, including the Apostle Paul. We experience the same conflicts. We experience the same fights that he experienced, and maybe not even on the same level that he did. He was beaten and imprisoned more times than we know. There were many times recorded. He's gone through shipwrecks. He went through a time of blindness, a time of adjusting his own attitude and premise and purpose in this world to find the real purpose in Christ. And those are the things that Jesus can do for us through the Holy Spirit. To trust in Jesus means life abundant. Jesus said, as recorded in John chapter 10, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. We can see a lot of that in the world. But look at the dichotomy, the difference, the distinct difference between what the thief does and what Jesus does for the world. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Have it abundantly. Have it more than we could ever want. Now, I got I to gotta be honest with you. We often say, well, you know, knowing Jesus hasn't really changed the way my life is going. It's been tough. And I want you to know that that is not the premise here. The premise is that everyone in the world is having tough experiences, difficulty. And I know that some of us may think that the more money we make and if we put our focus on just having everything and, and doing what we need to do to, to gain more possessions in this world, we can be a lot happier. And I got to tell you, those things are going to diminish and fade away. They don't last forever. What will you take with you into eternity? There are only two things you take with you to eternity. First of all, only your soul goes, but then there are two things that go along with that. Every relationship established in this world, who will also be in heaven, will be part of what we take with us. But secondly, we take the love of Christ into the kingdom with us. That makes, that will be amplified once we get there. The joy we have now will pale comparison to the joy we have then, but it's still joy because we have a ruler within us. But the difficulty we have today will remain in the world. It won't follow us into heaven. That can't be said for those who have shunned God and went on their own path. They will die taking all the difficulty in a magnifying way, magnified way with them into an eternal separation from God. The thief comes to steal and destroy. And he's working hard. But Jesus has come to give you a life worth living. All the many promises and hopes and life, all wrapped up into a purpose that he has planned just for you. A purpose that he's planned just for me to be lived out in this life full of uncertainty where that can be an absolute certainty if you decide to follow Jesus. I pray that you will become part of the organization now that's, that we can see is the church that's really going to change the, the way the world looks. It has already. Christ Jesus has already changed the, the atmosphere and the environment and the way things are done, the way we look at life and its goodness and the way we look at the evil in the world has already changed because of Christ. But it's not perfect and it's far from being where it should be. God needs us all. Join in on the fight and ask Jesus to come in to your heart and your life, to make you a person who is humble in spirit and yet driven to see the right things take place. You can do that with the spirit living within you. And I wanna offer you this opportunity today if you're already a believer, then let me continue to say the church, Jesus, the body of Christ, God, the Father needs you right now to awake, to be awakened to what is going to happen in the future. 
without God, what will this look like? And if we're not doing our part, if you're not doing your part, and I'm not doing mine, if you're not living out your God-given purpose, then we can see things become more and more difficult around us, our family and our community, even the world. But with you, God has a plan to turn this world upside down even more. If you're not a believer, follow me in this prayer. Bow with me. Father, I pray that you would insist upon my soul right now, that you would speak truth into my life. God, give me the power over myself to say yes to you and goodbye to the old style of living. I pray that you would make me that person that can call you my brother or my father, Jesus, my brother. I pray that you'd help me to know that you have forgiven me of my neglect of you, number one, and any of the other wrongdoings that I've had in my life. Forgive me, Father. Clean, cleanse, me, cleanse me and make me your child and give me that path that has a distinct purpose. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. God bless. What a great message. We were so glad you were able to join us today. We believe that a relationship with Jesus is more than attending church on Sundays. If you are ready to take the next step by committing to follow Christ, text BELIEVE to 317-827-8701. If you're ready to plug into serving or going in a small group study, we invite you to fill out our digital Next Steps card. We look forward to getting in touch with you this week. Have a great week. See you next time.